the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, sir, may I first join the right honourable gentleman in paying tribute to the speeches of the mover and seconder of the loyal address. Uh, my right honourable, my honourable friend, the member for Scarborough, like me, arrived in this house at his third attempt, and he's one of the most widely respected members in this house. He spoke, of course, on economic matters on which is a very great expert knowledge, and we listened to his remarks with great attention. He also spoke on the European Economic Community, where he was a member for some time, and where he played a very prominent role. We know, too, of his interest in trade union reform, and we also know of the great interest he's taken in defence, and we heard and heeded the advice which he gave. Rarely has the House listened to a better or more constructive speech from the mover of the address, and we do indeed warmly congratulate him and thank him for his comments. May I also congratulate the seconder of the loyal address, my honourable friend, the member for Dartford. As he pointed out, I first fought Dartford in 1950 and 51 and lost. My right honourable friend, the Minister of Agriculture, fought Dartford in 1955 and 59 and lost. My honourable friend fought Dartford in 1979 and won. Yeah. Yeah. What a tremendous future must lie in store for him that he triumphed <laughs> where the front bench could not in fact succeed. May we also congratulate him very warmly on his speech. We listened with great interest as he retailed some of the improving industrial performance in his own constituency and listened also to his comments on nationalisation and how badly it serves the consumer and the need to get a lot of it into the private sector and I shall have something to say on that account too. I warmly congratulate my honourable friend on his excellent speech. Mr Speaker, I wish I could warmly congratulate the right honourable gentleman on his excellent speech, but I do not really feel quite able to do that, either for what he said or for the way in which he said it. He made a number of references to things in the gracious speech. May I pick up one or two of them? He spoke first about my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State uh, Environment's concern about high rates. And we are all concerned yeah, yeah. about very high rates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that system was never designed to bear the levels of taxation which is being put on it now. Yeah. But it seemed indeed as if... But it seemed as if what the Right Honourable Gentleman was doing was saying that it was non-democratic to refer a matter to the vote of the people. Yeah. I find that very, very puzzling indeed. After all, rates themselves are not exactly a shining example of a democratic tax. Because only a minority of ratepayers, only a minority of electors are ratepayers, and many ratepayers at present haven't got a vote at all. He also referred to the, what the gracious speech says about trade union reform, and I'll be having something to say about that too. But we remember that it was his government that introduced two new measures of legislation which gave trade unions enormous extra powers yeah, yeah. and which ended up in the winter of discontent. Yeah, yeah. We also remember that it was one of those bills which enabled a person to be sacked from his job because he refused to join a trade union and yet under the right honourable gentleman's legislation that person would have been entitled to no compensation yeah, yeah, yeah. whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet he pleads humanity. That was hardly a humane piece of legislation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We heard exactly what he said about disarmament, but after all, we are urging multilateral disarmament yeah, towards yeah. in the grace of speech. Yeah, yeah. What he says, what he is doing, makes it less likely that those talks would succeed. Yeah, yeah. Because every time he pursues a unilateral line, why should we get the Soviet Union to the negotiating table? As it is, of course we're going to try. He said soon. And the United States talks, in fact, start on the 30th of November, and we wish them every success. 
But having listened to the speech of the Right Honourable Gentleman, one would hardly have thought that he was a member of a government which for five years preserved Britain's nuclear deterrent because he then thought it was in Britain's true interest to do so. We believe it is still in Britain's true interest to do so. He also began to, to talk about uh, reflation and suggested that during the early years, the 1950s and 1960s, there was a measure of reflation used. Indeed, in those early days, there was. It required only some tens of millions of pounds then to secure a few extra jobs. But as time went on, the dose got bigger and bigger. It required £100 million then to produce the same number of jobs. Then billions of pounds needed to be injected to produce the same number of extra jobs. And gradually the rate of inflation got higher and higher, and the effect on unemployment got less and less. And it was that that actually produced the stop-go system of the 50s and 60s. And eventually the rate of inflation got so high that the whole of the fixed exchange rate system was broke. And the discipline which applied then in those 50s and early 60s was no longer with us and we have to replace that discipline by something else. He also said that the period of high employment was of course the period of the early 50s. That was not to do with Keynesian policies, it was because there was a seller's market after the war yeah, yeah. and half Europe's industries lay in ruins and Japan's were not yet rebuilt. Yeah, yeah. Also, the pattern of world trade had not yet changed. Really, the right honourable gentleman must come into the 1980s and deal with the situation yeah. as it is. Yeah. Yeah. We did debate the matter of reflation last week. And it seemed from what the right honourable gentleman said that the right honourable gentleman's arguments to the member for South Down fully triumphed over anything which the right honourable gentleman said then or said today. Does anyone imagine, for example, that the German government would continue to pursue their responsible financial policies if they thought that by reflation they could solve their high unemployment? Of course not. (coughs) The Social Democratic Party of Germany knows full well that reflation would not overcome their country's problems, it would only make them worse. And so too in Britain, a policy of reflation would not solve the problems of the unemployed. On the contrary, by increasing inflation, it would put in jeopardy many of the jobs of the 23 million of our people who are in work, and it would dash the hopes of the 3 million unemployed that they would ever find lasting jobs. If reflation is not the answer, and it isn't, Mr. Speaker, the answer lies in practical steps to help the unemployed, and there are two kinds which can be and are being taken. The first are by special employment measures, and the second are by encouraging small business and the technologies of the future. Now, let me say a word about the direct measures. We announced a number last July, and they're only just beginning to come into effect. Last month, the number of trainees on the Youth Opportunities Programme rose by 55,000. On Sunday of this week, The age of entry to the job release scheme was lowered to 63 and in February it will go down to 62. On the 4th of January the young workers scheme will start but employers who take on young people now will still qualify in January for the help provided by the scheme. They don't have to wait until then to take youngsters off the unemployment register and on to the payroll. And by the turn of the year I expect that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Employment, to announce substantial further measures in the form of a comprehensive training scheme for the young employed arising from the consultations on a new training initiative. So all of that special package in July is now beginning to take effect and new measures will be announced by the turn of the year. Those do not, for one moment, I've only just started. Yes, I will give way to the the honourable gentleman. I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I usually do, because he usually helps me along very well, and I'm always very grateful to him. (laughs) Reflation would put the jobs in... Have patience, have patience, have patience. Reflation would put the jobs of the 23 million unemployed in jeopardy. The right policy is to help by special employment measures, and we are doing that. After I've given way to the Honourable Gentleman, I will turn then to some of the help we're giving to stimulate new jobs. The Honourable Member. Well, in order to help the lady along, 
would she not agree that the proposals that she has just come out with and the proposals made in July are in fact a reversion to policies which were pursued by the Labour government and yet they've still not got back to the levels that we had at the time of the Labour government yeah. leaving office. Yeah. Yeah. I understand from the Honourable Gentleman then that he fully agrees with the measures I announced in July. I'm delighted to have his support. I hope my right honourable friend, in fact, will have his support when he announces further comprehensive training measures. But you could have fooled me that the right honourable the honourable member looking at him now was actually supporting what we're doing on this side of the House. Now may we must also, Mr Speaker, stimulate the new jobs of the future. And the combined tax incentives announced by my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, in his last two budgets are now widely recognised to provide the best conditions the world over for encouraging the birth and growth of new businesses. We've taken a range of initiatives also on industries like information technology to ensure that Britain does not fall behind the rest of the world. And later this month, we shall identify some 20 sites concentrated in inner cities for training teenagers in computing and electronic skills. We also launched a £25 million scheme designed to stimulate research and development in fibre optics. Now, these are only a few of the many ways in which we've created a, a climate where small business can start and grow and where advanced technology can flourish and investment from overseas can be attracted. Yep. And under the policies of this government, investment from overseas in the high technologies is being attracted and right into the development areas where yeah. it is needed. Yeah. That is a great measure of confidence in the policies being pursued by this government. Yeah. And today, Mr. Speaker, we see British industry slowly but inexorably improving. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but inexorably improving. Of course, honourable members opposite won't like it. They love bad news and hate to hear good news. They know that reforms of labour practices which should have taken place decades ago have been achieved in a matter of months. That many firms have found new scope for cooperation between management and employees. That in manufacturing industries, we've seen productivity per man hour rising at a rate which is reminiscent of Germany or Japan. And this has been achieved in the teeth of world recession, at a time when increases in productivity are very rarely achieved. For years, honourable members on both sides of the House have talked about export-led growth. Now, for the first time, there's a real chance of that happening. This reflects falling inflation, moderating wage settlements, higher productivity and an exchange rate at a level where British industry can compete in the markets of the world. And increasingly, we see British firms winning contracts based on price and performance. Yeah. Mr Speaker, some would say that the changing attitudes that we see in industry won't survive a return to growth. I want to say a few words about this, because if that were to be so, we should all have failed. On this side, we want realism and a sense of partnership that will continue to grow when the lean years give way to expansion. Sound, common sense policies are as vital to a nation coming out of recession as they are to one which is still in its grip. And we must see that those sound policies endure. Mr. Speaker, we all welcome the fact that British Leyland is back at work today. <laughs> Common sense has prevailed and the company, which is painfully hauling itself back to profitability, is now able to get on with the job of making and selling cars. The British Leyland Board has today decided to put forward the company's corporate plan to the government. We shall, of course, study the details carefully. But it seems clear that the solid progress won at much cost over the last three and a half years can be continued. And with it, at least 200,000 jobs in British Leyland and its component suppliers and others can be safeguarded. 
Mr Speaker, we wish the company, its management and its workforce every success. To survive, Mr Speaker, all our industries have got to be competitive. There's no safe corner where the inefficient can shelter, indefinitely protected from the progress of more vigorous rivals. Now that ought to be as true for the nationalised industries as it is for the private sector. But many of the nationalised industries are monopolies not pressed by normal market forces and with no fear of bankruptcy to spur them to greater efficiency. Their costs and their wage increases inevitably flow through to the rest of the community in higher prices for their goods and services. These higher prices add to the costs of our private sector companies fighting for business in world markets. Yet price control is no answer. It is the costs that must be brought down. And our first aim is to try to expose these industries to competition. And that's why we shall bring forward legislation to end British Gas Corporation's monopoly in both the purchase of gas and the sale of gas to industrial consumers. Mr Speaker, a number of my honourable friends will recognise these words, which I'm going to quote. The British Gas Corporation is a highly profitable organisation which enjoys both the monopoly purchase right to all the gas in the North Sea and a monopoly of gas distribution. There is no good reason why an oil company which produces gas from the North Sea should be forced to sell its entire production to the British Gas Corporation, which then resells it to private industrial customers at a substantial markup. Because of the unrealistically low prices which BGC is able to impose on gas producers, output of gas has undoubtedly been lower than it might have been. There is no justification for the present situation in which gas producers are prevented from piping gas ashore and selling it direct to industrial customers such as the chemical industry. The breaking of the BGC purchase monopoly should be a high priority for a Conservative government. Mr Speaker, those words came from a recent much-noticed pamphlet subtitled what the government should do next. And I'm sure that its authors will be happy to see that the government has taken their advice at the first opportunity. Once there is competition, it's a pamphlet called Changing Gear, proposals from a group of Conservative MPs. Full of good stuff. The Honourable Member should read it. Mr Speaker, once there is competition, we must return as many industries as possible to the private sector, which can provide the best environment to stimulate further improvement and investment. We shall therefore be introducing a bill to transfer to the private sector, that is to genuine ownership by the people, the oil-producing business of both the British National Oil Corporation and the British Gas Corporation. It's private enterprise that has made North Sea the outstanding success story it is. And it's private enterprise that is the key to its continuing success in the future. But Mr Speaker, delighted. What does the Prime Minister indicate to the House what has happened to the much vaunted proposals of last year to privatise British Airways? What are the intentions of the government in that respect? Uh, has it all actually gone into the, into the sand? And isn't the, reality that it was, isn't the reality that those proposals deflected British Airways from really going ahead with capturing international markets? Oh, and building up, building up the morale of its workforce. No, nonsense, Mr Speaker. British Airways will be returned to the private sector when the market conditions are at their most propitious. But I assure that the honourable gentleman that it will. The legislation was there and it will go and very beneficial it will be. There are some nationalised industries, notably the big utilities, 
where it's very difficult to introduce competition and which are not easy to return to the private sector. Now, in those industries, Mr. Speaker, we must ensure that the absence of market forces is replaced by other pressures to induce greater efficiency. Now, some have already been referred with salutary effect to the Monopolies Commission. We shall make certain that the monopoly suppliers know clearly what is expected of them. We shall set tough targets because the health of the economy depends on their achievement. The future of many jobs outside the public sector lies in the hands of these monopolies, who, if their prices are too high, can push up the costs of industries in the private sector to push up their prices when jobs are lost. The House will have the opportunity to discuss the performance of the nationalised industries as we bring forward measures to deal with their financing. Honourable gentlemen are constantly talking about gas. Yes, there is a positive return from gas. May I point out that this year the positive return of the British Gas Corporation is something like £400 million. That is more than swallowed up by the subsidy to the National Coal Board of £1,100 million, and that is only one such subsidy to nationalised industries. And while I'm referring to heavy costs imposed on the private sector, We've been increasingly concerned at the extravagant increase in the spending of a number of local authorities. The government will, within a matter of weeks, be publishing a green paper on the alternatives to domestic rates. And in the meantime, we have to face an immediate problem. The majority of local authorities have cooperated with the government to reduce current expenditure. I might wish that the progress had been faster, but no one can question that the previous almost automatic annual increase has been reversed. But a small minority of authorities have absorbed virtually the whole of the economies achieved by the rest. And if we as a government pursued the traditional policy, we would simply cut the budgets of all authorities to compensate for the excesses of a few. The low spenders and the prudent would then suffer with the overspenders. Now, some say it's worth it in the name of local government freedom. We believe it's a curious sort of freedom that argues that the profligacy of the few should be paid for by the sacrifices of the many. Mr. Speaker, we shall introduce a bill to ensure greater accountability of high spending authorities. And at the same time, we shall introduce a measure of protection for the industrial and commercial ratepayers in those authorities. But the problems of British industry are not confined to those of direct costs. They are concerned as well with industrial relations. The response to the Green Paper on trade union immunities has shown that opinion is now firmly in favour of further legislation. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Employment, will therefore announce his proposals and a bill will be introduced in the new year. It will be designed to meet two needs. First, to provide better redress for those harmed by the abuse of trade union powers, particularly of the closed shop. And second, to redress the balance of bargaining power and to improve the prospects of a continuing growth in productivity. Now, although these proposals will meet with the customary opposition from some honourable members opposite, we believe they will be widely welcomed in the country as a whole. While the Prime Minister is in the middle of her interesting and exciting speech, uh, uh, I wonder... I wonder if I could sow a seed in, sow a seed in her mind that perhaps uh, something about picketing uh, might also be worthwhile putting into this new legislation, because I think it upsets a lot of people what they've seen um, in the unsuccessful uh, picketing that's happened at uh, BL in the last few days. I tell my honourable friend the proposals will be published before the bill is brought forward, and I have no doubt that a number of my honourable friends will have their advice to give to my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Employment. Uh, 
uh, I believe, as well as there being widespread report, for, uh, widespread support for a new bill on trade union matters, so too there'll be widespread support for our proposals for the social services. Now, one of the sad fallacies, which has been much trumpeted by honourable members opposite, is the belief that only by spending more money can improvements in the social services be achieved. Because of that view, too little attention has been paid to efficient administration and to making benefits simple and clear. And that's why our program this year takes these matters into account. A unified housing benefit, which we should bring forward, is a sensible and worthwhile reform. It will end the confusion of two competing benefits, one from the Social Security Office and the other from the local council. It will ensure that those most in need are more effectively helped and their rights are more clearly defined. Help with housing is one of the most valuable services of our welfare state. and We can now provide it in a much more sensible way. The government sick pay scheme has been discussed widely. We've decided that employers will receive 100% reimbursement for payments they make in the first eight weeks of sickness. The new scheme will be more efficient and will save some 3,000 posts in the civil service. Industry's careful and constructive advice has been heeded and the bill should command a wide measure of support. Both housing benefit and sick pay are part of the established provision which a compassionate society makes. Yet it's all too easy to be so committed to present provision that we fail to see other needs. This government is particularly concerned to do more for those whose voice is hardly heard and who by consequence are often overlooked. My honourable friend, the member for Dartford, referred to the measure to which I am now going to refer. In the last session, our implementation of the report of the Warnock Committee, which I set up as Secretary of State for Education, marked a major step forward for the education of the mentally handicapped. In this session, we want to make some far-reaching reforms for the most severely mentally disordered. Here, the last major change was introduced over 20 years ago by my right honourable and learned friend, the member for Hertfordshire East. It is to continue the pioneering work of the Mental Health Act of 1959 that we shall bring forward a bill to protect those who are confined to institutions for the mentally disordered. The changes we shall make will give to these, perhaps the most vulnerable of our fellow citizens, additional rights and protections. And the fact that they are a relatively small group who seem so easily to be forgotten only emphasizes the real importance of this valuable humanitarian reform. Right. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the gracious speech renews the government's total commitment to uphold the rule of law. Many of our people feel unsafe in their own neighbourhoods and even in their own homes. And the fact that crime, violence and terrorism are increasing throughout the world is no consolation. Most of our people want to reassert the traditional values of family and society. They recognise the role of the family and the school in bringing up a new generation which respects the law and accepts the need for order. It is with this in mind that our new criminal justice bill will strengthen the powers of the courts to make parents responsible for their children's fines. It underlines once again parental responsibility. It's only in a society where individuals take upon themselves the responsibility for restraining their own actions and teaching the virtue of self-discipline that both freedom and order can be guaranteed. Our backing for the police will be unswerving as with such courage and dedication they uphold the rule of law. They are our front line of defence. Already they have been dramatically strengthened in numbers and morale by the measures taken by my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, there are some <laughs> who from time to time criticise the police for the way in which they carry out their exacting tasks. We, however, have made our support for the police clear and unequivocal. 
I believe that they themselves would be the first to insist on those high standards which we have come to expect. They will ensure that all our citizens, whatever their background and wherever they live, can rely upon them equally for the protection which they need. It's natural, Mr. Speaker, that in the face of recent events, I should turn from matters of law and order to Northern Ireland. We will concede nothing to terrorism. Demands advanced by the gun and the bomb will be rejected absolutely. The government will meet the violence of the terrorists with implacable resolve. The ballot box is the means of change. We shall continue to seek a political solution because that offers the only way forward. We shall also continue with the effort to create closer and stronger links between the United Kingdom and the Irish Republic, whose Prime Minister I shall be welcoming in London very shortly. Mr Speaker, abroad the government's pursuit of the true interests of the nation will remain resolute. No country in our geographical position, with our historic traditions, with our pattern of trade, could turn its back on the rest of the world. And we spurn the small-minded and disingenuous policies advocated by honourable members opposite. They claim, for instance, that only they care about the arms race. It is a false claim. We all care. But we on this side of the House also believe that Britain should make a full contribution to its own defences. They intend to rely on the support which they assume the Alliance will provide whatever they do. And that is a dishonourable policy. They proclaim their intention to pull out of Europe. But they conceal the enormous political harm and economic hardship which would result. That is a dangerous policy. They parade their concern for the developing world but they favour schemes of general protection which would ruin many of the poorer countries and probably us as well. And that is a dishonest policy. Many right honourable and honourable members opposite know very well that the programme being adopted by their party would be profoundly damaging to this country. A few of them have acted on that knowledge. No doubt the rest hope to fudge their way to some dubious compromise. The composite motions have never solved real problems. Unilateralism is once more in the forefront of political debate. And I recognize that many of those involved are well-intentioned and sincere. But Mr. Speaker, motives, whether good or ill, are not the point. We have to reckon with facts as well as with feelings. The facts are that last year the Soviet Union deployed 250 new intercontinental ballistic missiles, 400 new military helicopters, 1,300 new combat aircraft and 3,000 new tanks. The Soviet Union spends nearly twice as much on defence as it spends on health and education combined. We spend barely half as much on defence as we spend on health and education combined. That gives some idea of Soviet priorities. Against that background, it is obvious that negotiated and balanced arms control agreements would be a great prize, a great prize for this country. The government therefore actively support the talks which are in progress in Geneva and Vienna. And we attach particular significance to the negotiations on theater nuclear forces, which are due to begin later this month between the United States and the Soviet Union. Through these negotiations, all can hope to achieve greater security at less expense. But unilateral disarmament offers no shortcut to that goal. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, unilateral disarmament would prevent us from reaching it. Why should the Soviet Union come to the negotiating table if we had already given up our arms? Does anyone seriously think the Soviet government would follow our example? Of course not. Will unilateral disarmament make war less likely? No, it will make it more likely. 
I don't say that because I believe the Russians are intent on war. I'm well aware how keenly the horrors of the last war are remembered. I say it because I'm also aware that the Kremlin's only success since 1945 has been in developing Soviet military strength. In every other sphere, they've failed either to meet their own targets or to keep pace with the West. Where it was safe to do so, Soviet military power has been used to disguise, both from the Soviet people and the rest of us, the collapse of the party's political, economic and ideological ambitions. We've seen this in East Germany, in Hungary and in Czechoslovakia, and we've seen it in Afghanistan. We've so far narrowly avoided seeing it in Poland. If we in the West allowed our resolve to waver, if thanks to the party opposite and people like them, the West became clearly weaker than the Warsaw Pact, then the temptation for the Soviet government to exploit our weakness and to put us under military pressure would be overwhelming. <laughs> Faced with that pressure, I don't believe that people in the West would allow their way of life to be destroyed without a struggle. At any rate, we on this side wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. The result would be war, a war no less... I don't believe, I correct myself, I don't believe anyone in this house would allow that, and I certainly don't believe the people of this country would, but we on this side would see that the people were properly equipped with the weapons they needed to defend their way of life. If we were weaker than the Soviets, the result would be war, a war no less destructive to the West for being unequal. There must be no illusions about this. Anyone who doubts what I'm saying should take an unblinkered look at this week's parade in Moscow and ponder the figures that I quoted a moment ago. And that's why we must never accept what has happened in Afghanistan. And I must say it was very heartening for me to see what was happening in Pakistan when I saw the other day the indomitable spirit of the refugees from Afghanistan. There was no failure of resolve there. And that's why we must go on stressing the need for the Poles to decide their own destiny without interference. That is why, finally, the wishful thinking of the unilateralists must be exposed. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the policy of withdrawal from the European community would also be deeply harmful. It could be carried out only at the cost of the most severe damage to the Western world, damage to our own political position, to our international trade, to the investment which we could otherwise expect from abroad, and to employment in this country, and it's folly to pretend otherwise. To say this isn't to close one's eyes, to the community's shortcomings. As my honourable friend, the member for Scarborough said, we have to look after this country's legitimate interests. And he pointed out how this government had done just that and will continue to do so. There's to be a European Council meeting in London later this month. Dominating the agenda will be the questions of budgetary restructuring and common agricultural policy reform. Means of resolving the present problems of resolving them on a lasting basis must be agreed soon. Mr. Speaker, the impact of the community on the rest of the world is growing politically. And I've seen this on two visits to the Middle East. It's growing economically. I saw this in Melbourne and Cancun. Above all, the community has been a growing source of strength and stability in Western Europe. And the government are determined that these achievements should be preserved and built upon. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, in the coming year, I believe that Britain's confidence in herself will grow. That confidence will come from an increasing realization that the signs of economic success are no mere passing hopes, but are instead a testament to our new economic strength. We shall look for a continuing improvement in productivity as we become more able to compete in the markets of the world. 
Real jobs will not be quickly won, nor will unemployment fall dramatically. But slowly and surely, the British people will create the new jobs which these difficult years have made possible. Above all, there will be a growing confidence that the major changes we have so long needed and so often shirked have now been made and that we will secure the kind of success which our neighbours have achieved and which has eluded us since the war. That success is not simply a matter of production figures, overseas earnings and income per head. Economic achievement is a vital part, but certainly not the whole of our national renewal. A new mode of realism and personal responsibility is taking hold in this country. A generation which was brought up to believe that governments can guarantee prosperity, full employment and happiness for all, now knows that life is not really like that. <laughs> that it never was yeah, yeah. and never could be in a free society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Generations learn that a successful community relies first upon individual effort. It's learned that collective concern cannot replace personal responsibility. It's learned that only when each one of us plays his part to the full will the whole nation benefit. This government has created the conditions in which out of the recession can come renewed confidence. It is in the coming year that our confidence will be rewarded. The success will be Britain's success and the achievement will be the achievement of all our people. Yeah. Yeah.